everybody. Uh, thanks for coming to my talk. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about TorqueBox and how it can potentially make your life um, just a little bit simpler. Uh, before I do that, um, just tell you about who I am. Uh, I'm a software developer for Red Hat. Um, I'm a contributor to TorqueBox. And I'm part of the Project Odd team, which is uh, sort of a polyglottish team at, at JBoss trying to bring uh, different languages other than Java to the JBoss ecosystem. And I contribute to various open source projects. But enough about me. Um, let's look at this uh, scenario. This is a scenario probably everyone in this room has had some experience with, right? Uh, you got a Ruby application, and um, you got to deploy it into production. Since this is RailsConf, we'll call it a, a Rails app. Uh, and what does that look like, really? At, at, its, at its simplest, at its most basic, um, that's a, a web server that's accepting HTTP requests and proxying them uh, off to your application. So uh, in this picture, it could be any sort of rack-based application. Uh, but that's usually something like Apache and Passenger. Um, but that is a really simple picture. And it may be that your application, when you deploy it today, looks like that. But if you're successful, and we all want to be successful, your application is going to grow. It's going to become a little bit more complex. Uh, and what? kind of complexity could be introduced into your application? Well, um, how about delayed job, right? Uh, most applications have some kind of task that needs to happen in the background. For example, user signs up uh, and you want to send an email, right? You don't want the user to have to sit and wait for you to format that email, open up a connection to an SMTP server and send it off. You want all that stuff to happen in the background uh, and have control return to the user immediately. So there, we're introducing uh, a, a little bit of complexity. Not a lot. Um, not a whole lot of complexity in your application, but potentially some complexity in your deployment, because uh, you got to think about a worker process. Uh, another source of complexity in your deployment environment might be um, scheduled jobs, anything that needs to happen on a regular basis. Maybe you want to send a, uh, a monthly newsletter out. Uh, so once a month, um, you, know, you send this monthly newsletter, and you handle that through uh, CronTap. Uh, and then finally, you might have some kind of long-running process or a daemon uh, that runs. In this picture, it's uh, some sort of monitoring process, but it could be anything. I mean, let's say your app wants to um, you know, process tweets about Justin Bieber. So you have a long-running process uh, on your server that uh, opens up a connection to the Twitter fire hose and um, grabs all those tweets and stuff them in your, stuffs them in your database. So again, a little more complexity. You have to think about in your deployment environment. How are you going to get this long-running process up and running? What are you going to do to manage it? And when you think about deployment, there's kind of a continuum. On one side, there's, uh, there's rolling your own, right? Uh, where you're going to get uh, you know, a dedicated box or a VPS, uh, and you're going to do everything yourself. And then on the other side of that continuum is a platform as a service, um, something we're all probably familiar with, like Heroku. And kind of in the middle there uh, is TorqueBox. So what is TorqueBox? Um, TorqueBox is a, a Ruby application server. It's built on uh, JRuby and JBoss AS7. And if you're not from the Java world, you may not know what an application server is. That's OK. It's basically just a, a long running process that lives on your server, hosts your application, and provides uh, a number of facilities and functionality that your application may take advantage of. So uh, this picture that we had of all of these disparate things now all come together uh, as a, a single unified thing, uh, and that's the TorqueBox application server. And like I said, it's built on top of JBoss, so JBoss exposes a bunch of APIs, Java-based APIs for messaging and scheduling and, and services and that sort of thing. Uh, TorqueBox layers uh, a, a thin Ruby API on top of all that stuff to make it available to your Ruby applications. So let's take a look at what it means to um, deploy a TorqueBox application, or any application, any Ruby application. Um, if you're going to roll your own, like I said, you're going to do everything your in yourself. You're going to install an operating system, a bunch of packages, you're going to configure everything and you're going to manage everything. So what does that look like? This list is not really exhaustive, but 
uh, probably you're going to do something like Apache. Uh, you're going to think about a load balancer. Um, you might use Unicorn or a pack of mongrels to host your app. You have to think about CronTab and setting that up. You might want to figure out how you're going to put your CronTab files into source control because that is source. Uh, you might even think about SMTP if your application is, is uh, sending out email. Uh, and don't forget memcache. And then, of course, database and deployment and monitoring. All these kind of standard things that, that you think about when you think about uh, your Rails application. Um, you can make your life a little bit simpler uh, by outsourcing some of that stuff. And we're all familiar with things like SendGrid or, or Amazon SES to make SMT. I don't know a single Rails developer who wants to manage SendMail. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> so um, yeah, so you'll outsource SendGrid. Uh, your email to SendGrid, um, you know, Capistrano for deployment is fairly standard. Uh, and then monitoring, you can use something like New Relic or Scout. Okay, so your life's getting a little bit easier. On the other end of the spectrum is the platform as a service, like Heroku, where you're basically outsourcing everything except your application. So our long list of things that we have to think about now becomes Heroku, 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 SendGrid, Heroku, Heroku, New Relic. Um, and Heroku is fantastic. They um, make it incredibly easy to uh, deploy your applications. Um, Torquebox does not run on Heroku yet. We've made some efforts to, to make that happen, but it hasn't. It, it's not happening just yet. Um, so the picture with Torquebox uh, gets um, gets a little bit simpler, I guess. Torquebox replaces things like CronTab uh, and Unicorn or your pack of mongrels. Um, for load balancing, we have mod cluster, which is uh, Torquebox aware. Uh, so as you bring up uh, more Torqueboxin in your uh, deployment environment, mod cluster becomes aware of them without uh, any additional configuration. Uh, out of the box, you get um, uh, caching with Torquebox. And then a lot of this other stuff kind of stays the same, like deployment and monitoring. So let's look at this in a, in a real world case study. Um, Appalachian Sustainable Agriculture Project, or ASAP, is a, a, a great little nonprofit organization in the mountains of Western North Carolina. And their goal is to bring local food providers and local food consumers together. And they have a Rails app that was written, I don't know, three or four years ago uh, to, to help them do this. Um, and it's fairly standard for like a, a mid-sized Rails app that was written three or four years ago. It's 2.3.11 right now, I think. Um, uh, and you know, they have standard needs, caching. Uh, there are some background tasks that happen. Uh, there's a cron job that runs. Uh, they want to. They're, they're currently running it on Heroku, so they're used to deploying with um, with Git. They do some email, the sending of email, and you know, the database queries and stuff like that, uh, and um, monitoring and metrics. So these are all the things that they have to think about uh, if they want to um, deploy their application. And on Heroku, that's not really thinking about a whole lot. This is what it looks like on Heroku for them. They're at the kind of base level. They've got one worker dyno. Uh, and one web dyno, and it costs them about 50 bucks a month. Um, but they kind of feel like they're at the, they're, they're sort of pushing the ceiling of, of what that $50 a month uh, service from Heroku can provide for them. So in this particular case, they think they might be able to save a little bit of money by going to Linode and using a VPS, like a, a, I think the 1024 VPS is about 40 bucks a month at Linode. Uh, and let Torquebox absorb some of the complexity involved in rolling their own system. And they can potentially have a system that will allow them to grow without um, you know, ramping up the cost significantly. So what is it going to take for them to move their application over to Torquebox? First, let's look at the development environment. Um, in development, I like to use RVM. Uh, and as I said, Torquebox is based on, on JRuby. Uh, so it's a single line install for JRuby if you're using RVM. RVM install JRuby and then um, basically you just gem install Torquebox server and boom, it's there. But don't everybody do that right now because it's a pretty big installation. It's a couple hundred megs so we'd bring the Wi-Fi to its knees. Uh, and once you've done that, you've got Torquebox installed. Uh, and then we want to convert our application over to Torquebox 
When you install TorqueBox, you get a, um, a little command line, Tor TorqueBox command line, that allows you to do a number of things. And among those things that it allows you to do is apply a Rails template to an existing application. So TorqueBox Rails, my app, will apply uh, the TorqueBox Rails template to uh, my app. Uh, and if there's not a Rails app there, uh, then it will create a new one called my app and apply the template to that. So what does the template do? Uh, not a whole lot. Um, it basically just adds some gems to your gem file. Uh, all the TorqueBox gems, or at least the ones that are important. Uh, and um, Active Record JDBC adapter. Since this is um, since TorqueBox is based on on or layered on top of JBoss, and JBoss is Java, uh, we're going to use JDBC for our connections. Uh, but that's all hidden from you as a Rails developer. Um, we just set that up with the template. Uh, it adds some TorqueBox support to your rake file, and then creates a couple of directories in your app folder for things that we consider to be sort of first class components of a given application, like services, uh, long running services, and scheduled jobs. Uh, and then sets up caching uh, for you uh, and your web sessions to use TorqueBox's built in caching. Uh, and then initializes Active Record in a way so that it can easily take advantage of the backgroundable functionality that we have in TorqueBox. And once you've done all that, your application should run just fine under TorqueBox. No problem. Uh, but is that enough? Like I said, we want to take advantage of all the really cool things that TorqueBox has to offer uh, to make our lives a little bit simpler. Uh, so we're going to do a little porting of the application to do that. Uh, and we'll start with background jobs. Currently, the ASAP application uses delayed job. Uh, and so we will use the functionality that's built into TorqueBox called backgroundable uh, to um, run those delayed jobs in the background. So here's how it looks today. There's a, this is uh, in one of the controllers. There's a create method. Uh, and a new active record object is created um, called Excel export. Um, and that Excel export has a method on it called, I think, generate report that takes a really long time to run. We don't want our user to have to wait for that to happen. So we create a new Excel export job. And if you've ever used delayed job, this should look fairly familiar to you. A new job, we give it an ID, and then we put that job on, uh, on, the, on the queue. And this is what the Excel export job looks like. It's just a struct. Um, and it has a perform method, as all delayed job structs have. Uh, and all it does is take that ID, find the um, active record object, and call that long running generate report method. Fairly straightforward. Uh, now, and this is, this is that generate report method. I'm not going to walk through this code here. But basically, what it's doing is writing a bunch of uh, stuff out to disk and then sending it up to S3. And of course, you need to have a, a worker as well. On Heroku, you don't have to think about that. You just click or use the command line or whatever to add a new worker dyno, and you're good to go. But since we're moving uh, this ASAP application over to a new environment, we have to think about that. Uh, and this is, um, I don't know, just a little picture of what it all looks like. So there's the active record object, and your struct, and a worker, and your database. That's all kind of explicit. TorqueBox lets you do this uh, a lot easier, basically with one line of code. Uh, so let's see what that looks like. Here's our um, Excel export object again. Um, and it's got that method, generate report. I've pulled most of the code out of there. The important thing to note in here is this class method called always background. So we call always background, and we say we want to always background this method generate report. So now, anytime. Uh, generate report is called on, uh, on this Excel export object. It returns immediately, and all of the work that generate report does happens in the background. Nice, right? So our controller um, now becomes a lot simpler. All that delayed job stuff goes away, and we can just call export.generate report and know that uh, control will be returned to the user immediately, and TorqueBox handles the backgrounding of that for us automatically. And we can get rid of that. So now our little picture, our little diagram, 
we get rid of the struct, we get rid of the worker process, and we kind of have this implicit magic that happens in the background, where basically Torquebox is putting a message on a queue, and there's another process in the background that's picking up that message, and we'll uh, uh, run that generate report method for you. So that's backgrounding, pretty simple, one line of code. Um, let's take a look next at caching. Torquebox has caching built in. Um, now, when you apply template.rb, um, that kind of does all the work for you. Um, it basically sets up uh, your web sessions to use the Torquebox cache. Uh, and all of the other caching, the fragment caching and whatnot that happens in Rails uh, uh, is configured to take advantage of the Torquebox cache as well. The Torquebox cache is based on Infinispan, which is a uh, replicatable, distributable, highly available key value store that um, does uh, automagic clustering. So if you, for example, have a number of torque boxes in your cluster, uh, your sessions are automatically clustered. Nice, right? There's not a whole lot more to say about that other than we don't have to remember to fire up memcached anymore, which is nice. I don't know how many times I've forgotten to do that and can't figure out what's going on. Uh, and you can also use that cache um, if you'd like, just sort of ad hoc for anything. Um, and you can give it a name if you'd like to. You can persist it if you'd like to. Uh, this is just some, you know, sample code. So the next thing we want to look at, as I said, is uh, the ASAP application uses cron jobs. Um, and in cron, there's, uh, or I'm sorry, on Heroku, there's a free version of cron that runs once a day. So they take advantage of that. It's implemented as a rake task, um, and it includes your application environments. Fairly easy to use. And on the ASAP application, this is what it looks like, or sort of what it looks like. Uh, we've got our rake task. Uh, they have basically a trip planner where um, you can, you know, uh, plan a trip to go visit a bunch of farms and whatnot in the Appalachian Mountains. Uh, but we need to have GIS data for that. So once a day, the cache is updated with um, GIS data from all of the information in their database. And I don't like cron, so I don't want to do that. I want to use scheduled jobs that are built into Torquebox. Scheduled jobs are sort of a first class component of your application. Uh, and um, they live in a folder called apps jobs uh, under your Rails root. Uh, and it's really simple. It's any Ruby class. Uh, and as long as it defines a run method, it runs. Uh, and so uh, there's no code here to, to, to look at. Basically, we're just going to update the GIS cache. This is how you configure it. Every um, Torquebox application has a configuration file called torquebox.yaml. And there's a job section in there. Uh, and you basically just tell Torquebox the name of the class, uh, give it a cron string, and you can optionally provide a description. So now when your application is deployed, your scheduled job is automatically deployed with it. Uh, and you don't have to think about it again. And your entire application environment comes along for the ride. So when that, uh, when that scheduled job runs, uh, you have access to all of your active record objects. You have access to basically anything that you have defined in uh, in your Rails app. But in this particular case, doing this huge query once a day and updating the cache wasn't really ideal. It was just the free version. Um, you know, we, we, we could have done something where we're updating this cache on the fly in the background. But again, um, that's a background task. So they have to think about maybe firing up another worker dyno, and that's going to cost them a little bit more money. Uh, so the solution on Heroku was to just kind of do this once a day thing. And it was OK, uh, but not ideal. Uh, we want to see if we can make it more better. Uh, so we'll use Torquebox services um, to avoid that big query uh, and keep the data fresh. Now, what do the services look like? Again, it's any Ruby class. Uh, and all you have to do is define a, a couple of methods. There's an initialize method, which takes a, a hash of options that you can specify. You can specify these options in your torquebox.yaml file. Uh, and here in our initialize method, um, I'm creating a handle to a message queue, which, again, is built into Torquebox. Uh, and then we've got a start method. 
your start method in a long-running service typically is going to want to return immediately. Uh, so we create a new thread. We initialize the cache. Uh, and then we spin on a Boolean value, basically, as, you know, as long as we should run, uh, we want to update the cache with any message that comes on that queue. Uh, so queue.receive is blocking. When a message comes in, it's passed to update cache, and the cache is updated. So who sends the message to that queue? Um, it's our active record object, the business. After that business is saved, we presume there's been some change. Uh, so we um, have a, sorry, we have an after save hook that says uh, update trip planner. And the update trip planner just gets a handle on that same message queue uh, and publishes the ID of the active record object. So that's the message that is received here. Right? And there, uh, I, I like these little diagrams, I, I guess. <laughs> Here's the little diagram. Uh, active record object uh, makes a non-blocking call to publish something on a queue. In this case, it's just its ID, but it can be anything, any Ruby object. Uh, and the service makes a blocking call to receive that message. Once the message is received, it's up, it updates the cache. Uh, so that's pretty much all we had to do to port the application over to use uh, some of these nice facilities that are available in, in TorqueBox. What is it like to deploy this into production? I mean, that's sort of the purpose of this talk, right, is making your life a little bit easier in the production environment. Well, I work for Red Hat, so I have to um, put this up here. <laughs> I don't have to, but uh, they're, they're running on uh, Linode 1024, uh, and uh, it's running on, I think, Fedora 15. It's not in production yet. Um, it's a, a staging server right now. Um, setting up the server is, is really simple and straightforward. It's a, a few uh, uh, package installations, yum install. Uh, and here, basically, we're just installing Java, since um, TorqueBox is based on JRuby. Um, HTTPD, mod cluster, get, git, and PostgreSQL server. Can't forget about the database. We want TorqueBox to launch on boot. Now, in a, I mentioned earlier that there's the, um, the, the gem, TorqueBox server gem, that makes it really easy to install TorqueBox. I typically use that in my development environment. Uh, but on a production environment, uh, we have a, a zip download uh, that includes TorqueBox and all of JRuby. So you just download that and uh, unzip it basically anywhere on your server that you'd like to, and it includes uh, an initd script. Uh, you can just stuff in etsy initd uh, and now TorqueBox starts up uh, when, uh, when the server is booted. There is some configuration that you can do there and um, basically just specifying you know, what user you'd like TorqueBox to run as, uh, where TorqueBox actually is, where you'd like to write the PID file, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, but it's just a few lines of configuration. As I mentioned earlier, um, we have a, a, a load balancing solution with Mod Cluster. Uh, Mod Cluster is an Apache module that's JBoss aware. So as uh, you know, new torque boxes come up, uh, Mod Cluster is aware of them automatically. And if you've ever done any configuration of your Apache web server, this should look kind of familiar for, familiar to you. We're just loading. We're just loading this module, uh, and. Um, setting up a, a virtual host. Once you've got this configuration in your, um, in your HTTPD configuration file, you're good to go. Uh, requests come into Apache, and they're automatically forwarded to TorqueBox. Deployment, again, is um, Capistrano. Really pretty straightforward stuff there. We provide um, some Capistrano recipes so that you can for example, start and stop the TorqueBox server. Uh, but cap deploy uh, basically ends up with something like this. No different than cap deploy in just about any other environment. And then your application grows, and things change and evolve. Uh, and this is part of the motivation for uh, the ASAP organization to move to TorqueBox because they have ideas about things they'd like to do in the future that might involve things like WebSockets. 
uh, which are built into TorqueBox as well, uh, or high, high availability. For example, sending out, if, if, you're, if you've got a cluster of torque boxes and you've got scheduled jobs, and one of those scheduled jobs, for example, is to uh, send an email to your 30,000 subscribers, well, you don't want every node in the cluster to um, actually send out all those emails. <laughs> that would be bad. Uh, so uh, we provide facilities for um, high availability and, and singleton kinds of functionality there. Now, can we take this any further? Yeah, I guess we can. I mean, what is a, a, a platform as a service, really? Well, it's in the cloud, uh, and it's kind of like what we've been looking at already. It's an application with a bunch of services wrapped. It's, it's something that will host your application uh, and provide a bunch of services for it. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention that Red Hat um, actually does have uh, a PaaS offering called OpenShift. It's fairly new. Uh, but TorqueBox runs on it. Uh, it runs on the free version of it just fine. So if you're interested in giving TorqueBox a try, I'd recommend you know go and check out OpenShift. And we have uh, the TorqueBox team has a GitHub repo uh, with information about uh, how to get up and running, get started uh, on OpenShift. So the roadmap for TorqueBox um, and the status: uh, we're at 2.0.1, uh, which was released I think last week. Um, we expect continued investment from Red Hat. There's no reason they would uh, stop funding this effort. Uh, and in fact, we're working on interoperability with other kinds of languages, like Clojure, uh, through a project that we have called Immutant. Immutant is uh, basically TorqueBox for Clojure. Um, same kind of thing, runs on top of the JBoss AS7. Uh, and potentially down the line, uh, maybe JavaScript as well. Resources available to you if you're interested in TorqueBox are um, the website, obviously. Uh, we're on Twitter at TorqueBox, and we have a, a, a really active and friendly IRC channel. Um, and no question is too stupid to ask in the IRC channel. Uh, so if you're playing around with it and you get stomped, definitely pop in there on Freenode. So, I guess I talked fast because, you know, when I rehearsed this thing, it took me 45 minutes almost every time, and I'm done. <laughs> uh, so, uh, any questions? Anybody have any questions? Yeah. I'm sorry, it, does it handle what? Right. Um, it, the background jobs happen in a completely separate process. So um, yeah, it would be a separate pool. Yeah. Uh, you ever one set and comes out probably in a month? Are you guys going to have the support for that button soon? Uh, we expect to, yeah, very shortly afterwards. We're working on it right now. We, we have a pretty good relationship with the JRuby guys. In fact, we find a lot of bugs for them. Um, uh, so, um, yeah, we, we, we hope to have a one, JRuby 1.7 version of TorqueBox available very shortly after it's released. And the second, the second question, when working in a development environment, um, what, kind of, what kind of fields do we expect if we switch to the from startup cost to time for, you know, we're using WebRick? Right. Uh, it's not going to be as fast as WebRick. I mean, when you, when you start up TorqueBox, the, the, the big thing is, um, uh, you know, firing up the JVM and everything. That takes a little time. But once that's done, um, it's actually r really performant, very fast. Um, and I think it takes about, so, you know, I said there's a, there's a, the TorqueBox command line. So you could just type TorqueBox run, uh, and that starts it up. That's sort of like, you know, running WebRick. And it takes about four and a half or five seconds usually, maybe up to seven seconds, uh, depending on you know what you've got going on in your application, how many applications you have deployed. And I didn't mention in this, you can you can um, you can deploy, you know, three, five, eight, twenty, five hundred applications to the same instance of TorqueBox as long as you have the hardware to back it up.
Yeah, in back. The South Uh, I think primarily right now it's the slug size. It's pretty big. Um, we've, we've played with it and, and worked a little bit with some of the Heroku guys to, to try and get that worked out, but right now I think it's primarily the slug. Yeah. Uh, our serving of web requests and uh, the background jobs, are they running in the same JVM or different? So, so I'm concerned, so what? happens if my background job eats all available memory and as a result my web requests might start to fail of that. So are there, can you somehow isolate uh, background jobs and these tasks in the queue from the, the main response? Is, uh, yeah, they are all running in the same JVM and I guess you do have to think about that if your background jobs are um, you know, consuming a, a huge amount of memory. Um, we've found, though, generally that with, um, I'm certainly with the the case study here that I showed you today, uh, but most applications are just fine running in about a gig of RAM, probably less. Yeah. Could you detail sockets a little bit more? Could I detail it? Yeah, like, um, does that tie into the Rails application, or is it provided through services run on top of the application server? It, it ties in with your Rails application. I, it's, it would be kind of hard for me to, to uh, get into some of the details without showing you some things, but if you go to um, github.com slash torquebox, we have, I don't know, 20 or 30 different repos there, and one of them is a, a sample application that uses uh, WebSockets to, um, I think it's a chat application or something like that. So you can take a look at it. It's, it's fairly simple and straightforward. Yeah. I'm sorry, I, 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 yeah. I, I can hear you. Is there any monitor? How do you, how do you check the status of your application? Right. Uh, so, well, New, Re New Relic works well. <laughs> uh, and we have some nice integration with New Relic. So, for example, the backgroundable jobs will show up in your background tasks tab in New Relic. Um, we also have a, an app called Backstage. It's a little Sinatra app that you can install and run that alongside your application. Uh, and that gives you insight into things like what the cache is doing, how big it is, uh, what message queues are active, what message, or how many messages are on the queue, that sort of thing. If you're used to using Rescue and Redis, it's not like that. Um, it, Eventually, maybe someday will be. We'd like it to be, but um, it doesn't have that much insight into your queues yet. Uh, but it does give you insight into all of the other little bits and pieces uh, that are part of uh, Torquebox. Yeah. So, uh, with testing and continuous integration, are, are there any considerations there? Yeah, there are. Um, if you want to run your specs in the torque box environment. We have, uh, we have a testing framework that allows you to uh, basic to do that, to, to run your, it'll fire up a, a torque box and run all your specs within the context of that torque box. All right, well, thanks for your time. Thank you.